this, it's another beautiful day. And as you put on your morning shoes and start your daily routine, you're secure in the knowledge that there's a lost skeleton of cadaver. You took special comfort this morning in the fact that no matter what happens, a loud and egotistical assemblage of bones is there waiting to tell people what to do. Terrible sarcasm and all. Yet it's also perhaps something we've come to take for granted in the intervening years since his first appearance on the silver screen. Yes, it wasn't always like this. It seems like only yesterday. Like all great ideas and some religions, the lost skeleton began with a great idea, one born of necessity. Larry Blamire was already well known as LA's premier shoe dancer, but people were starting to turn away from shoe-based entertainment and he soon found himself out of a job. Like many other shoesicians before him, he turned to screenwriting. His wife, Jennifer Blair, a former U.S. Senator and Chorus Girl, as usual encouraged his every waking move. Like many budding writers, Larry played around with various hot-button ideas. Foremost among them was a remake of a film now considered lost, the original 1922 silent The Lost Skeleton of Cadabra, directed by King Samus. Larry had managed to watch a copy before all prints were destroyed in a freak bowling accident. Though he enjoyed the film, he felt certain parts could have been better. As it turned out, so did the actual real-life lost skeleton, who considered the work something of a travesty. Not much better than those old little lost skeleton cartoons. It was then the bony one decided to exert his influence. In a peculiar reflection of the story itself, the skeleton placed Larry's wife Jennifer under control. Since dessert is the best time of the day for mental domination of humans and some marine life, Jennifer transferred the thoughts to her husband through a series of carefully coded lattice crusts, another irony not lost on the bony one. Larry was sold. He went immediately to his friend Miguel Valenti, an experienced underwater sculptor and porpoise salesman. Miguel agreed that such a film might be possible, thanks to recent advances like the walkie-talkie. Together, they worked out a budget and went to Larry's friend Lars Perkins, a successful lawn appraiser and fine-tooth comb specialist. Lars, seen here looking over designs for the various spoons used in the movie, agreed that Larry and Miguel were onto something. They now had the green light. For special prop building, they enlisted Larry's old friend Courtney Skinner, a recently paroled ex-con who'd learned monster making in a prison shop. Soon it was time to round up the cast. Larry dyed his hair science silver and went to see his pal Brian Howe, a grocery store owner with a long-time interest in skeleton movies. They agreed he would be ideal for the villainous role of Dr. Roger Fleming. Faye Masterson was discovered farming. What a delightful Betty she'd make. Dan Conroy, an actual park ranger, brought authenticity and expertise to the role of the doomed ranger Brad. Robert DeVoe was discovered making tiny cups of coffee, perfect for the part of the sinister, moody farmer. Darren Reed, a disgruntled motorist, was chosen to don the costume of the hideous mutant. For the role of the skeleton, they hired a high-priced skeleton hand bone model named Dryle Vernu. But the real coup was finding Susan McConnell and Andrew Parks, an actual alien couple. For the pivotal roles of the Marvin's crowbar and lattice, they would bring an understanding of aliens that we Earth people could only dream of. Last but certainly not least came the beloved role of Bossy. When a mechanical cow proved too expensive, an actual cow was hired instead. 
Even Bossy gets the star treatment. Betty likes Bossy too. Soon the movie was in the can. But the final completion of the film was up to Bill Bryn Russell, a retired dock worker who owned several large machines. It was this cutting-edge technology that turned it all into a fine piece of motion picture entertainment through a long and involved technical process that, well, frankly, even we don't understand. His film completed, Larry began the arduous task of trying to sell it. This would require a lot of pounding of pavement, not to mention some comfortable shoes. At first, there were no takers. After all, who wanted to see a film about a talking skeleton, they said. Boy, would they regret that later. They finally went to see Michael Schlesinger, a studio executive known for having floating things in front of him. Mike saw the potential right away, remembering his own childhood love of sarcastic animated bones, as well as jokes about squirrels and cabins. He saw a surefire hit. The only thing he asked for were several small cuts. Gone were the singing Armstrong children. Also gone, Timla, the hyper-aware crossing boy. Then the film premiered, almost winning an Oscar in the newly created Best Strings category. And the rest, as they say, is history. But wait! Stop! What if all that hadn't happened? What if there never was a lost skeleton of Cadavra? Ever stop to imagine what that world might be like? A world without lost skeleton? So just what would it be like? The first thing we notice is the price of tiny cows is drastically higher, causing children to grow morose and introspective, even suspicious. Unfortunately, adults react by holding ice cream out of reach in a deliberately taunting manner. To compensate, young girls make offerings to the people in the ceiling, and organized bouncing becomes the chief form of communication. People question their own furniture and start turning in carefully controlled circles as a way of coping, while a guy named Ed tries to make people eat his lunch. Some begin to look for answers in clear candy dishes. Still others begin treating food like a member of the family, often inviting it to sit at the table where they talk to it like an old friend they no longer eat. By week two, the dolls are turning and distinguished, well-dressed giants start telling us where to park. Before long, complete strangers are welcomed inappropriately. And yet simple ironing becomes more and more dangerous, making the elderly almost rabidly competitive. Health codes for breakfast cereals break down, and fire stations give mandatory haircuts simply because dogs are now made of sand. By week four, common ladders attach to people like dangerous parasites, forcing some to surround themselves with shimmering lines. Cigarettes are now lit at special lighting stations, and evacuation becomes the world's second most popular team sport next to meat boating. Perhaps worst of all, television, that beloved nightside companion, becomes peevish and incomprehensible, causing people to fall into a strange malaise. But whatever it is that's causing this epidemic, I don't understand it, and I don't like it. Naturally, town meetings are organized so people can fight back. But against what? How do you fight an unseen enemy you can't see? How do you fight a lack of lost skeleton, something you'd never even know about in a world without lost skeleton? It's simply a thing no one could have foreseen. 
Oh, sure, at times there's hope, as though the very act of talking might present a solution. But a sinister housewife named Calabindum always seems to have the last word, and people file out once again, jumbled and confused. Not a very pretty picture, is it? Fortunately, you and I don't have to worry about any of those things. We live in a world that does have a lost skeleton of cadaver. Terrible sarcasm and all. We live in a world that's, well, I guess you could say it's just as it should be.